Welcome everyone. Welcome to this fireside about arts. This fireside that is held with the presence of Mr. Hooper Dunbar that made us very, very happy to accept joining us tonight. In this November 15, 2020. Uh, the theme today, uh, tonight, as you know, is harmony in arts in the universe and in God's revelation and uh, a perspective of arts and beauty according to the Baha'i revelation. And uh, as you all know, uh, Mr. Hooper Dunbar does not need introductions, but maybe his side as an artist is less known to everyone. So uh, we decided at least make a brief introduction that touches that part. Uh, after 50 years serving the Baha'i faith, many years in the Holy Land, first as an international counselor, member of the International Teaching Center, and later as a member of the Universal House of Justice, Southern California born painter, Hooper Dunbar has resettled in Granite Bay, California. His extensive range of work is represented in numerous private collections, principally in New York, London, Hong Kong, Verona, and uh, Sydney. And his paintings are exhibited in, in Ethan Cohen Fine uh, Gallery of Arts in Manhattan, were exhibited in the United Nations offices in, of the Baha'i International Community and, and many other places. But the reason why I share this with you is because uh, Mr. Dunbar will have a unique perspective, not only as a Baha'i that goes deep into this subject and many others that you have seen in the last uh, many years, but also because this is a perspective that is maybe very close to his heart as well as a painter, as an artist. So without further ado, uh, welcome, dear Mr. Dunbar, Thank you for being here with us tonight. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to, to join you all. And I, I'm seeing a kind of panorama of faces here, of some people who have known in the past and greetings to all of you. Um, the subject matter tonight's a bit overwhelming. I mean, art is, yes, close to me. And I'm th I think about it a lot, but uh, the, the very nature of the of the title is uh, challenging, so to speak. I we discussed with the with Nason, with your host, the possibility of a, a brief overview of the Baha'i teachings and uh, <clears throat> something that would indicate to people perhaps new to the Baha'i teachings why we would give such importance to the writings of the central figures of the Baha'i faith. And uh, in that connection, I'd just like to say a few things about the cause itself. And the cause, of course, has been gro growing over the past decades, century. And uh, both because of the claims that Baha'u'llah makes in his writings on the one hand, and because of the extent to which his teachings have been embraced and adopted by people all over the world, and so that we have 180 national communities, Baha'i communities around the globe representing practically all the peoples of mankind, uh, the faith, uh, lays claim to being a world religion uh, and it's on that on that basis of course what Baha'u'llah says about his faith and then what people have accepted and to the degree that they've uh, absorbed the revelation of Baha'u'llah the uh, purpose of the Baha'i faith coming uh, at the time that it has now uh, it sprung originally from Shia Islam, and in the early stages of its development, it was regarded by the followers of both Christian and Muslim faiths 
as an obscure sect, an Asiatic cult, uh, or an offshoot of the Mohammedan religion. The faith itself is now increasingly demonstrating its right to be recognized as not one more religious system superimposed on the conflicting creeds which for so many generations have divided mankind and darkened its fortunes, but rather as a restatement of the eternal verities underlying all these religions of the past, as a unifying force which instills into the adherence of these religions, and those are the present day Baha'is who've come from other religions to, to join in this singular faith. It's, it's renewed and instilled in them a new spiritual vigor, inspired them with hope and love for mankind, fired them with a vision of the fundamental unity of the religious doctrines of the world. And it also has unfolded to our eyes the glorious destiny that awaits the human race. The fundamental principle elaborated by Baha'u'llah in his teachings and taught to the Baha'is all over the world is the principle that religious truth is not relative, but and is not absolute, but relative. And that progressive revelation is continuous. Divine revelation is continuous and progressive. So you have two things that stated first. And uh, people may wonder what is this uh, religious truth is not not absolute, but relative, the teaching of the prophets of the past was adjusted and conformed to the possibility of the understanding of the people and the age in which it was addressed to them. Um, this is, uh, I think, clearly uh, most people have heard the verses of Christ where he says that, uh, I have many things to tell you, but I cannot tell you now Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you unto all truth. The basic uh, thrust of the Baha'i teachings is that we need to establish the spiritual unity of all mankind. There has to be a recognition of the oneness and wholeness of the human race. That we're all living under one God. He's provided the means for everything that if we could organize ourselves properly, would provide sufficient well-being for all the peoples of the planet, but we've, we've been responsible for organizing it in corrupt ways, and this has uh, not led to the well-being of mankind. That's what he's calling us to do. He said, consider that we are all made from the same dust. We're all the, the creatures of one creator, and the religious truth that we have in this day is necessary. I mean, there was no way we could call for the oneness of mankind, Baha'u'llah says, in the past, because there was no knowledge, for example, science and uh, had not developed to the degree that people had any knowledge except that the earth was flat. That's a relative truth. It worked fine for then, it doesn't work for now. And maybe sometime in the future, when we understand more about what's happening on other planets, we'll have another, another view of life and the universe and we'll need teachings relative to that. But right now the goal, the essential goal that Baha'u'llah has given us is to proclaim this uh, oneness and wholeness of the human race. We're all mutually interdependent and we need to serve the interests of mankind above the interests of our individual nations, although we have not, we're not unpatriotic or anything of the sort, but uh, there are some higher truths to which the great powers of the world have to bend in order to establish not only a recognition of the unity of mankind, but actually a representation of it in the way society is organized. 
So this is this is something that's happening now. Little by little, the spirit released by Baha'u'llah who appeared in the mid 1800s and proclaimed his faith, uh, releasing energies, infusing energies into the planet, into the potentialities of the human race and of the development of the world that are gradually crystallizing into agencies and uh, expressions. And this includes the sciences and the arts. We'll come to that uh, in a while. And uh, they, it's vaulting us forward out of a period of terrific spiritual darkness. Gradually, it's dawning on more and more people that we need another uh, form for life. We need more life direction. And uh, for the Baha'is, they're excited that they've found the message of Baha'u'llah, which has generated this interest and enthusiasm for promoting the oneness of the world. And uh, the, that's the, the source of joy to us. And we are happy to proclaim the nature of the faith to others. Uh, this is not meant to be proselytizing. Proselytizing means tempting people with some material benefits for following your faith or forcing them unduly. Uh, we, we shouldn't introduce the whole question of proselytization in the Baha'i faith because the Baha'i faith is, we're, we're called by our, the messenger of God in this day to proclaim the truths that he's given and that it's everyone has free will and they can decide whether that it's attractive to them and meets the needs that they see for, for their own lives and that uh, we're not to argue with anyone or unduly insist on anything of the of a spiritual nature uh, i'd like to just cite a few of the other aspects of this fundamental principle of progressive revelation. Shoghi Effendi, the guardian of the Baha'i faith, calls it continuous. It's a continuous revelation. It's, it's the singular voice of one God down through the ages expressed in what we now know as the various uh, religious expressions of mankind. These expressions uh, conform to the needs of the time in which they appeared. Again, relative, not absolute. Together, so that we can see that it's one eternal faith, eternal in the past, eternal in the future. It's not destined to stop. It doesn't stop with the Baha'i teachings, nor with Baha'u'llah's revelation. He's promised another revelation in a thousand years hence or more. If we look at the history of religions, each new religion has recognized the past. It's recognized, for instance, Islam recognizes Christianity, it recognizes Judaism. Christianity recognizes Judaism, but they don't move forward with their coming because of the gradual uh, influence and corruption of people who headed the, the faiths. Uh, whatever good intentions they had, it's not the point to criticize them, but they established certain guidelines so that they could maintain their flocks uh, for their own purposes. So we are still waiting for the return of Christ after the appearance of three more messengers since he appeared. Uh, from the Baha'i point of view, that's very interesting to look into the history of this and see how, how it was developed and how Baha'u'llah says that each of the religions should not only recognize the prior revelation, but it should confirm the subsequent revelations. In fact, move forward because now mankind is called to a new way of seeing and understanding things. The, we find that the basic principles, spiritual principles of all the religions are in harmony. 
and their aims and purposes are one and the same. Their teachings are facets of one truth, one single truth. Their functions are complementary, and they only differ in the non-essential aspects of their teachings, such as food laws or the, the form the prayer should take. Prayer is always there. Eternal life is always there. Love of God is always there. These are the fundamental teachings that we all share together. And Baha'u'llah calls these is consider these likenesses and set aside those things which cause differences and hatred amongst people. He also says that the that these revelations represent successive stages in the spiritual evolution of human society. In other words, these faiths have paralleled different types of unities that have been born and consolidated in the world. Way back in the days of subsequent to Adam, we have the unification of the family unit, recognition of the importance and the sacredness of family. And then the next stage was tribal unities. And then we came to city states, the establishment of city states. And with Islam, we saw the birth of nationhood, individual nations and countries. Now we've moved ahead to an extreme stage of uh, nationalism. And Baha'u'llah says this needs to be superseded by the recognition again of the wholeness and oneness of life on this planet. Some a uh, few basic points from of the Baha'i teachings. We've already mentioned that it upholds the unity of God, the oneness and singularity of an unknowable creator. Um, we shouldn't imagine God in terms of how we may have heard of him in the past or how we may presently imagine what God is. But Baha'u'llah says it's impossible for human reality which is relative to encompass the absolute impossible so he said out of the mercy the greatness of the mercy of god he's provided human figures to deliver his message to us from age to age and these are these great messengers of god the Mo an abraham a moses a christ muhammad and in this day Baha'u'llah and his uh, partner in Revelation, the Bab. These two figures constitute the main source of all of the scriptures of the Baha'i faith. Baha'u'llah says that nothing short of the transmuting spirit of God working through his chosen messengers can ultimately succeed in bringing about this unification of the world. And this, this is quite essential. And uh, I think the Baha'is are, uh, they wrestle with it in their, in their own lives because it doesn't have much, it doesn't seem to have much relevance to what people are thinking and talking about now. And uh, we see in the Baha'i writings some very strong statements about how we are at the darkest stage in the spiritual evolution of mankind. We've really gone into a state of materialism where we've arrived at a time when uh, some daring authors have even said that God is dead. It's, it's an extraordinary difference from the past. We don't all, I think, study enough history to, to realize how different that outlook is from even 200 years ago. The materialistic way we imagine that the acquisition of goods and the um, forcing of religion into the background and condemning it or negating it in any way we can it's become the, the habit of mankind, at least of the more educated elements of mankind. 
And this has to be overcome, has to be um, superseded. And this needs a transmuting power. And that power, Baha'u'llah says, has been released by his revelation, by his teachings. Teachings of the manifestation of God, he calls these new messengers the, in this day, manifestations of God, the, the era of prophets and prophesizing the future without consideration for the present has been superseded with the day of fulfillment, he calls it. And this is part of the whole promise of the whole line of religious teaching over the ages. It's come to its consummation now and Baha'u'llah has delivered it full form. And for the first time we have the revelation written in a, in a complete manner, approachable, studied by individuals. And therefore he has called for the elimination of priesthood. There's no priest or in the Baha'i uh, faith. Uh, there's no sacraments so that that doesn't, doesn't arise. Each of us approaches the manifestations spiritually with our own spiritual powers, our own individual, the force of our soul and our reasoning and our meditations and consideration of the contents of the teachings in this day that forms the basis of our belief. Baha'u'llah has enjoined on everyone the primary duty of an unfettered search after truth and the truth when Abdul Baha proclaimed it in the West he said is the revealed word of God. This is the greatest source of truth we have is the is the central truths that are conveyed to mankind through the scriptures of the past. So Baha'u'llah says, if you will investigate them in a detached way, not coming with all the prejudices that we have individually uh, because of our own faith, because of our own race, because of our own outlook on life or social class, whatever it is, to just look at the pure teachings and see that they are the expression of one light. They're all luminous. What did Christ say? He said that the, the sheep recognize the voice of the shepherd. And this is the, you remember Christ talks about the time of one shepherd and one fold. This is the, this is the challenge of the age we live in to arise above the mists and darkness of materialistic outlook on life, which denies us our heritage. The revelation of God is for our bounty, for our development. Establish that the scriptures of the manifestations are the source of light to the human soul. Um, in the Baha'i teachings, it says we have two aspects to our nature. We have an animal physical, material nature, and we have a higher spiritual nature. The spiritual nature is latent. It's a potential within the soul, within our consciousness, within our existence. And through the influence of the verses of God, that is the elements of scripture of the religions, uh, those truths are animated like seeds. They begin to grow within our consciousness and they produce what come to be the arts and sciences of the world we live in. So with that thought in mind, thinking about the immense dimensions of the words of the manifestation of God, they're not ordinary words, they're quite extraordinary. Listen then to one passage from Baha'u'llah about the arts and sciences. He says, the son of truth is the word of God. The light of the son of truth, this central orb of the universe, if you will, spiritual orb of the universe, shines through their words, the words of the, these great spiritual teachers. And upon this depends the education of those who are endowed with the power of understanding and of utterance, in other words, human beings. It is the true spirit and the heavenly water through whose aid and gracious providence all things have been and will be quickened. 
its appearance in every mirror is conditioned by the color of that mirror. For instance, when its light is cast upon the mirrors of the hearts of the wise, it bringeth forth wisdom. In like manner, when it manifests itself in the mirrors of the hearts of craftsmen, it unfoldeth new and unique arts. And when reflected in the hearts of those that apprehend the truth, is revealed, it revealeth wondrous tokens of true knowledge and discloseth the verities of God's utterance. Another passage that I'd, I'd like to share before we go on with a fuller explanation about the arts and sciences themselves. Baha'u'llah has said that every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God is endowed with such potency as can instill new life into every human form, if ye be of them that comprehend this truth. All the wondrous works you behold in this world have been manifested through the operation of his supreme and most exalted will, his wondrous and inflexible purpose. Through the mere revelation of the word fashioner, issuing forth from his lips, and proclaiming his attribute to mankind, such power is released as can generate through successive ages all the manifold arts which the hands of man can produce. This verily is a certain truth. No sooner is this resplendent word uttered than its animating energies stirring within all created things give birth to the means and instruments whereby arts can be provided, produced, and perfected. All the wondrous achievements ye now witness are the direct consequences of the revelation of this name. Now, with a whole lot of other passages where it describes that this world is dependent on a spiritual world, which is the world of reality, that this is a, a shadow. Uh, it's like the image of that world but on water on the surface of water it's it's very tenuous and through the verses of god we come to understand and we become the means as do other souls who've passed on to the different world we're told they become the channels for distributing knowledge of sciences and arts to the people of the world this is a very different picture from the kind of imagination that produces art out of the human ego and uh, takes pride in it. And it's a, very, it's, a very, it's a very different image and one we need to gradually absorb. Abdu'l-Baha said, with the coming of this revelation, all kinds of new discoveries will take place. He said, um, the aspects those qualities of the kingdom on high of the spiritual realm where we pass after death which is a much superior infinitely superior world to this one and which we are all destined to enter and enjoy he says that um, those powers have to come in to the, because of the coming of such a great revelation from god as the one that baha'u'llah has brought those things have to come into the life of mankind and all kinds of discoveries and wonders he said you will behold for instance he says you will see a time will come when anyone anywhere on the face of the earth will be able to speak face to face with anyone else whenever they want I th I'm afraid the Baha'is were totally astonished by that. Said, who can understand that? And they di it didn't get spread around very much. Of course, now you know we've got our phones and are well on the way to this possibility of seeing face to face anybody we want at any time. This tablet was not uh, generally known, and uh, Mr. Tarzadeh one of the members of the House of Justice that uh, I served on in the Holy Land brought it to the attention of the House in about 1995. 
and it's quite 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 uh, amazing. Of course, by now, then we had a possibility of understanding what what might be coming, but not even as much as we have now. We have much more knowledge of that, and think of in terms of uh, the arts and sciences. By the way, arts and sciences in the Baha'i writings, sciences are knowledge, pure knowledges. They're not the, uh, it's knowledge of chemistry. It's not the actions of chemistry. Actions of chemistry, the application of the sciences, that's what are called arts in the Baha'i revelation. But it doesn't exclude the fine arts. They're included too by Abdu'l-Bah makes mention of them. But they're not exclusively that. Abdu'l-Bah talks about the art of dentistry, the art of agriculture, for example. This is, is something that in the Baha'i teachings, these arts, the application of how to use the knowledges that the science has provided or that our science has developed through uh, experiments and thinking and knowledge of, of everything that is scientific in nature, the, the, that, en that energy then creates new materials and new possibilities. Besides the inspiration of content in art, which I think traditionally was always the to reveal to men through art the, the highest and latest form of understanding of our creativity, of our relationship with our with our maker. Uh, I was it reading uh, this, <coughs> excuse me, this past week, a book by Leo Tolstoy, What is Art? It's his. Uh, it's quite, quite a, a revelation. You know, he said that up until the 14th and 15th century, art was the expression of spirituality uh, in every case. And uh, this would include architecture, include the expression, all the expression of the different arts. But he said, after that, it became the plaything of the upper classes and became exclusive and it moved off its spiritual base. And now he said that, um, he's sorry to say that the content of art reflects the baser nature of man. And uh, that th this is expressed in so many in so many ways in in the development of literature, films, so on. He's saying, for example, this is Tolstoy. He says that the there is there's no modern novelist of the new novelists that have come along in the last what in the time that he was alive where the, there is not a strong current of sexual desire expressed in the, in the writings. And on top of that, he said, adultery is always the subject matter of literature. Literature is one of the expressions of art. I mean, this poetry, the same has fallen victim to the same thing. So now all of that has to be lifted and uh, as an artist, as a painter, uh, one is working with a, a very early expression of the Baha'i spirit of art. Shoghi Fendi said it comes along much later. It's not something that, it's an expression of a civilization. Baha'i art, Baha'i music, Baha'i literature, all of these things will evolve and gradually appear in the world not not all at once and it's too early to know what form they will take but wondrous and beauteous they will be i wanted to quote something from shogi Fendi on that subject if i can see it is certain this is a quotation from a letter of the guardian the guardian being shogi Fendi. It is certain that with the spread of the spirit of Baha'u'llah, a new era will dawn in art and literature. Whereas before the form was perfect, but the spirit was lacking, 
Now there will be a glorious spirit embodied in a form immeasurably improved by the quickened genius of the world. So this is wonderful prospects that we have, have ahead. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know myself, my art, the, the, the things that I felt impelled, compelled to paint were of an abstract nature. Uh, it, perhaps that avoids some of the problem of the sensuality of art in general in, in drama and theater and films and so on. So the Baha'i concept is that the, these higher arts and sciences are all present in the next world. They exist there, they operate there, and way, way infinitely ahead of us. And then they, the souls of those that dedicate themselves to understanding divine truths and trying to serve the uh, requirements of revelation, which in this day mean helping establish the oneness of mankind, taking care of the poor, helping the whole situation of the human race, recognizing it as as one family, and we all we all need to be concerned with all of it. Then we have this uh, flow into the people of new arts, and they are the expression then of their own inner convictions and meditation on the um, divine verses, the teachings that are resplendent, really, in Baha'i literature. That's kind of the connection that we have with the, um, if you will, with the revelation in terms of art. And uh, new Abdu'l-Bahá talks about everything has been renewed in the world through the coming of the revelation of Baha'u'lláh. And he has... Um, I'll see if I wanted to find one particular passage from our writings that speaks about that. Words of Abdu'l-Bah, the successor and uh, the son and successor and interpreter of Baha'u'llah's teachings. From the writings of Abdu'l-Bah, the animal is the captive of nature and cannot transgress the rules and laws thereof. In man, however, there is a discovering power that transcendeth the world of nature and controlleth and interfereth with the laws thereof is something that the animal realm doesn't have, although we participate with an animal body, but we have this other added quality of transcendent consciousness and soul. Likewise, man discover, discovereth those hidden secrets of nature that in conformity with the laws thereof must remain concealed, and he transfers them from the invisible plane to the visible. Also, he bringeth to light the past events that have been lost to memory and foreseeth by his power of induction future happenings that are as yet unknown. As furthermore, communication and discovery are limited by the laws of nature to short distances, whereas man, through that inner power of his, that discovereth the reality of all things, connecteth the East with the West. This too is interesting with the interfering with the laws of nature. Similarly, similarly to the law of nature, all shadows are fleeting, whereas man fixeth them upon a plate photographic plate and this too is interference with the law of nature ponder and reflect all sciences arts crafts inventions and discoveries 
have been once the secrets of nature and in conformity with the laws thereof must remain hidden. Yet man through his discovering power interferes with the laws of nature and transferreth these hidden secrets from the invisible to the visible plane. So these are the possibilities, I, th I think, for by artists for, of all sorts to meditate and ponder and bring forth wonders from the unseen world. And the, the applications of, of science, again, are en enabling us in the world of art to come bring forth all different kinds of products and materials and uh, developments, Ter terrific nuances constantly bursting onto the hu human uh, scene. It's, it's quite extraordinary. Where did it all come from? You know, from the time of Christ until the time of the appearance of the Baha'i teachers, the Baha'i manifestations, it, it took the same time 2,000 years ago as it did in modern times to travel, for instance, from Jerusalem to Rome. You could go by sailing boat or you might be able to go by donkey or horse, but you weren't going to get there any faster. And now suddenly we vaulted into this new period where everything has changed. It's, it's just extraordinary things. So we can only imagine that in the field of arts, there will be similar developments. We already see so many things happening in architecture because of the materials that have been developed also. Apart from the conceptual forms that great uh, architects have given to their, their buildings. Nezan, I think that um, I, I have that attend. gives us thrown enough no, idea out I, there that maybe people will have something. I, to I, I have to some questions about. here, uh, Mr. Dunbar, but but since you mentioned new materials, I always I remember uh, going to Hi-Fi and listening to um, talks about what the future uh, shrine of uh, Baha'u'llah would be, the construction above. Uh, the shrine and the, the guardian had mentioned that it should cover and encompass not only uh, the the Harami Akhtas, of course, the inner shrine and the most important place for the Baha'i faith, but also uh, the 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 mansion. So I was always thinking that it should be humongous and it, it will be in the future materials that were created. And I just read something that uh, for the first time science fiction is uh, uh, happening actually, they are inventing transparent metal, transparent aluminium that would allow a structure to be transparent and very wide. So, as to your point, you never yeah. know the things that will happen in the next years, right? Uh, there's a question in the chat section about the definition of artists and application of science is something new to me. This is this inner relationship between, between science and art in the Baha'i writings is extraordinary. I can't give you a single quote, but all of the ones about arts and sciences, if you're if you're in touch with the Baha'i uh, websites where the Baha'i scriptures can be found, you can search out arts and sciences, and you'll find you'll find that uh, the definition extends. I mean, we used to imagine that arts or sometimes we get confused in the application of this in our local Baha'i communities we're supposed to teach arts to our children so we we think about ballet and ice skating or recitation of poetry or something sort it's so much more than that it's it's all engineering of all sorts and um I think by the fact that in the Baha'i writings you find this, the mm, art of, for example, dentistry or agriculture, it takes a careful reading of it, it's quite, quite clear, it's quite understood by the, those that read the original writings in Persian, that this is the case, that arts are the applications, science is the 
just the knowledge is the knowledge base from which then we derive all these applications. Someone else is asking here, with your permission, uh, Mr. Dunbar, uh, uh, Elizabeth Tanky is saying, uh, however, uh, whoever possesses power over anything must elevate it to its utmost perfection, that it not be deprived of its own paradise. This is from the Bob. I think yes, in relation quite. to this. Yes. Me, he talks about that in relation to arts and particularly with architecture. He says that if you're going to build a house, you have to do it to the best of your ability. The design has to be the best you're capable of. If you fall short or you fall under the, this search for perfection, he said that you will be called to account for it. It's not just something light. Anything we do in the world, we should try to do it to the best of our abilities. So he draws on us to raise ourselves up to not just somebody to make a quick book, but actually investing our highest intentions and thinking in it. Also, uh, Melanie Grimmins, uh is asking, is saying, uh, can you talk more about how the connection between words affects and in, in, inspires art? Well, there's a, you know, I, it strikes me as you asked, you asked that, uh, in the writings of the Bob, the forerunner, as we said, there's these two messengers in the Bible that have given us the Bible faith and the Bible teachings. He talks about the verses of God. He said, every, the, we, we saw how this word, the fashioner, what an influence it has. He says, every word of every verse has a meaning. The verse has a meaning, divine meaning. And then he said that the individual words have their own meaning. And then he said the letters of each of the words that constitute the spelling of the words have each a divine significance, all of which can be elaborated and, uh, and unfolded. And he said that's the, that's the surface meaning of the verses of God. Then he said all those meanings have hidden meanings behind them which can be penetrated depending on the sanctity of one's soul and the intention, the proper intention that one has to recognize and celebrate the knowledge of God, the hidden meanings can be attained. Then he says behind ev all of those are recondite meanings. And behind those are meanings of mystery. He goes on with five levels of that all of it has those multiple levels of meanings and then he says and so forth or this like infinite the unfoldment of just a single verse and then he writes a commentary on a surah the surah of kosar in the quran which is the verse of it consists of three verses. It's one of the shortest of all the surahs, the chapters of the Quran. And he writes a 750 page commentary on the implications and meanings first of those, the three verses together, then of the verses individually, then of the individual words, and finally of the letters of the, of the words. Extraordinary. Uh, someone is we asking you. Uh, we can't terminate exploring the writings. Uh, the guardian had a visitor, pil pilgrims, one night. He was asking them, have you, have you read Baha'u'llah's book, the Kitabi Gan, the book of certitude, where Baha'u'llah explains about the purpose of creation and the mission of the Bob and so many wonderful truths. And he said that uh, the people, that he was talking to the subsequent pilgrim group, he said that I asked that last week here and the, around the room and said, the person said, that I've read it a couple of times or I've read it. And well, he said, one man from the West said, yes, Shoghi Effendi, I've done it. And Shoghi Effendi was saying, you can't do the Kitabi Gan. Now in the light of what we're, 
hearing about the multiple meanings of the divine verses, we can't uh, we can't finish all the Baha'i writings by reading them once. It's uh, immense field to explore, and that then becomes the source of lifting our consciousness. And when our consciousness is lifted, we're more susceptible to the influences of the spiritual realm and of the leaven which detached souls, Paola says, provide to this world to inspire us with new arts and sciences. It's extraordinary. Yes, uh, someone is asking uh, a, a very, uh, I mean, to the time we are now at COVID and everything, he says, I'm a biochemist and worked for many years on vaccines. I never thought I was performing art. I always thought I was not a good artist. <laughs> Have I been wrong? I think you can think about and, and revise perhaps your outlook on this. It's the same process of the mind working and asking itself questions and getting answers. It's an extraordinary process, this medit meditative process that humans are capable of. There's another thing, you know, Baha'u'llah in, in one of his tablets, he says that we bestow sciences and we remove them. Knowledges we bestow and remove. For instance, he said, take the example of the Greeks. Well, for a time, we poured bounty upon them and they came forth with all kinds of sciences and understanding and vision, and the great authors that we have in. And he says, and then we removed it. And they've been having a hard time since, since then, I don't know. He said that um, there were discoveries in the past in the world that we don't know anything about. For instance, he said it was possible to transmit sound over 60 kilometers in the time of the, the Romans, but we've lost all trace of that. And the power of steam was understood early on and then got lost again. That's another one he mentions. So, Mr. Dunbar, Abdullah uh, talks about, you know, work is worship. And he said that uh, when it's done in the spirit of service, it's, it has the character of prayer. And he said, when you he spoke, he's speaking to Baha'i painters in the United States, when you lift your paintbrush and you begin painting, this is an expression of, of prayer. This is a, a, which is nice because it means our occupation and our develop of our sciences and our development of the <clears throat> technologies in service to mankind is, is, is all prayer. Work is worship, terrific concept, as it sanctifies the whole of our existence, our lives, our output. If I might, I would like to combine. There are two questions that I think could have a relation. Uh, one of them is uh, beside the beauty of an art piece he produces, how can an artist serve mankind with his skill? This is from Mora Baruch in Haiti. And, and the other question is, uh, uh, Mr. Dumbert, uh, this one is uh, from Xiao Zhe, Xiao Zheng. To everyone is uh, Mr. Dumbart, this is Xiao Zhe. Can you suggest how Baha'i community can better support Baha'i artists? Oh, I wish I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, it's again where most of our Baha'i communities are at a very primitive stage of development. In fact, the whole Baha'i world is, is struggling to, to uh, increase its identity and, and understanding of what it's about as part of what's, what's going on in this formative age as defined by the guardian of the Baha'i faith. We're in the formative age. We had a heroic age of the Baha'i faith in which the literature and revelation was delivered to the Baha'is and to the world. And now we have a formative age in which the forces and energies that were infused in the heroic age of the faith 
are crystallizing into agencies through which they can operate in the world. And these agencies are the processes of the administrative order of the faith and so many, and so many things that are happening in the outside world parallel to, the, to, the, to that as well. So we have to be patient. He said, you know, this is not the time Abdu'l-Baha said to decorate the building. It's to try to get the thing to stand up. We're building the walls. We're building the solid structure of the future of mankind. And, you know, okay, we'd like to paint pictures on it, but is, it, is that really the time? Uh, I heard a story of a, a lady who was on pilgrimage with the guardian. She said that my son is, is quite a good violinist. Should he dedicate his, can he dedicate his life to playing the violin? And the guardian hesitated a little bit. He said, if he's of genius level, yes. Otherwise, this is not the time, really. But the geniuses should express themselves, surely. OK, uh, there is a, a question here. Uh, how do we recognize the wonders from the unseen world when there is very little unity on the question of what constitutes art and wonder? Uh, can you repeat that again? Sorry. Yes. Is how do we recognize the wonders from the unseen world when there is very little unity on the question of what constitutes art and wonder. I think that you know, each individual has to answer that. It has to do with the level of their own um, belief, the quality of the nature of their faith, the spirit of faith that they have, I should think, would has a lot to do with that. You know, look at the Baula said in this, the, the light of the word of God is refracts in different individuals in different ways according to the color of the glass of their nature. All of us have, uh, what's extraordinary is we're all individuals. We all have gifts that don't match anybody else's or they could match, but we also have our unique, we have unique aspects in our nature, which come alive under the influence of the revelation. And if you excuse me, obligatory prayer and fasting and those very central pillars of spiritual life that Baha'u'llah invokes us to follow. And in, indeed invokes the world to follow the law of Fasting, Baha'u'llah says, we've applied to all the peoples of the world. He invokes the peoples of the world to fast. He doesn't say, oh, you Baha'is fast. He says, so peoples of the world, we've enjoined upon you a fast. Finished. They have to catch up and, <laughs> and understand what that's about. So likewise, so many other discoveries that we have in the faith, we have to come to them through our own prayers and the cleansing of our own nature. Two big veils that keep us from seeing things clearly, Baha'u'llah says. One is the veil of self, self-love, ego, and the other is the veil of sensual desire. These are the two things that come to us from the body of our animal nature. Have you thought about the fact that we are like we have free will, we stand in the center of our own being, so to speak, and we receive the influences of the right and of the left, just to just describe it that way. On the right, we have the uh, angels of the all-merciful. I think in one of our prayer books, we say at the beginning there how when we recite the verses of God, they're able to take the influences of that and scatter that to other souls, stir other souls with it. Likewise, they are the sources communicating to us ideas and thoughts 
then both in, in terms of the thinking that we goes goes on and in terms of the uh, inspiration we derive from it then on the other hand we have the evil whisperer who's constantly whispering to us insinuating to us all kinds of rational explanations about well why shouldn't i do this thing i know baha'u'llah says don't do it but do you see any baha'is doing it or do you see anybody else doing it no well uh, sure surely we have a little wiggle room here we can do it and that that's this evil whisperer that he says is constantly countering the affirmations the guidance that we're, we're getting through the revelation and the free will apparently free will we have a free will the bob says in one of his writings he says the the free will has been given to man to choose the will of god any other use of it is illicit mm -hmm. is is not correct so we have this free will apparently we're independent beings and we we're in charge of ourselves and so on we're so proud of ourselves and carrying on that we don't we don't submit to the revelation of these great religious the founders of the great religions it takes so long for it to permeate our reality and uh the ego holds us down to we study a lot and we think well i know more than other people now and i've got more degrees and i've got this and that all these things are terrible obstacles to a clearer flow of the divine truths that come to us in moments of prayer in moments of meditation meditation is where the greatest influence comes to us shoghi Fendi says you know the prayer without meditation is like useless you have to think about what you've prayed for what what prayer is for when you read passages try to in the quiet of your own being you know absorb the teachings that are implied in what you've just read mr dunbar uh one of the things that our friends that visit the the word center of the baha'i faith have always engraved in their memory when they tell us oh i visited your baha'i center and your baha'i world center they are so impressed with the gardens and the beauty and the balance and the harmony of the gardens and uh, so this question has something to do with that i think is from kirk johnson he says i'm going to tell my wife from now on that i'm going to do my art when i am going outside to work in my garden i enjoy landscaping so much and find so much joy and wonder in it but thinking about it possibly as creating beauty and artistic expression is so wonderful thank you dear mr number you're welcome. <laughs> the, the thanks has to be passed along, along to the founders of the faith who give us all these things. Now, I want to read something here. And Sonia Kirchhoff has very kindly said the term arts, funun. Of course, it's funun, and in many, sanaje is, is, is another word, sanaje, sanaye. Sanal J, I think it is. And Funun with the arts. And she said that the this term Funun is broader in Persian than English, meaning applied technique. In this context, the distinctions are the application of something and ordered knowledge. So that then art history would in this context be considered a science because this is about ordered knowledge this raises the question of what is meant when abdul baha for example discusses the arts yes it has a lot we need to reflect a lot on these passages compilations on arts and sciences 
in understanding the arts in a much broader way. But it shouldn't, uh, and I just, as a, as a word of caution about this, we shouldn't eliminate the fine arts out of this because they're very high expressions or should be very high expressions. Now, uh, if Tolstoy is right, where he says that they should, art should be the highest expression that man can make it of his of the leading edge of discovery of spiritual understanding of the you can see how the expression of the revelation in outer sciences even in something like textile design islam was the is the example that is so is so great buddhism to some degree and but i think islam particularly in the arts of all kinds of ceramics and the architecture and the texture of the buildings and the rugs and calligraphy and everything is it brought it brought wonderful expression to all these realms of human practice Mr. Dunbar, there are some questions here more on the personal nature. Uh, people are asking me uh, if you could elaborate on your own artistic process and inspiration. And, um, and another question that is related is, uh, what inspires you to start painting? And what do you feel when you paint? Um, I, I start painting usually struggling with myself, arguing with myself, wrestling with myself. You're not a painter. What foolishness. What is useless thing doing here? Get out and do something useful. Don't paint. And I struggle and I re-edit old works and I fool around trying to catch catch again the the flow of the inspiration that uh, when I'm in a, in the flow of painting it's, it's very strong I'm, everything excites me every bit of paint every drop every flow is, is stimulating to me and usually then I'm I'm suddenly I'm painting five paintings at the same time not just one not a little bit doing this I'm have more ideas that I can possibly express on one canvas and they spill out onto other. Then there's this, so there's this explosion of what I call chance in painting, in particular kind of painting I do where you don't plan ahead, you move, you move very quickly with colors and splashing of paint. But after that, there's an editing process. So it's, it's, Chance and choice is the way I describe it. Uh, I don't, uh, I don't go to the table where I paint and pray. I pray in the morning. I pray in the evening. I pray whenever I feel like praying. But I don't say, "Oh God, give me a masterpiece" or something like that. I don't do it that way. I'm ex developing my own the feelings that I have towards the expression that's going on in the art and that that goes on it can go on days and then i get exhausted and then i leave it for a while i don't paint all the time i don't paint every day and interestingly enough after my health crisis in austria i've come come back i've been back since uh, december i i have painted little or nothing but I've just been involved in with some friends and volunteers who came in cataloging everything. We find that I've got 330 paintings here. Uh, it's time to move them. It's time to create a, a volume of showing the art in it. And those are the kind of things I'm, I'm looking at now. And according to the definition of technical application i suppose this is another kind of art is getting it into a book and letting more people have access to it if they're interested apparently they are but i i know that the 
I know the possibility of breaking into the again into that inspiration, but then I'll have so many paintings that I can I can hardly move in my studio from the amount of work that's here. So something, it's another stage of practice and life. Mr. Number, there are people asking us to show your art, but I, I, I will discuss with you the permission to edit this film. And while you say these things and the, you refer to them, we can have some of the pictures. And so that when we post this at YouTube, you'll be able to see some of uh, Mr. Dunbar's creations. But one of the people that had a very unique question about the process is Amit Bogal from uh, Toronto. He's asking, Mr. Dunbar, do you find yourself cleansing your art and process by producing works in a constant spirit of service? Mm. It may come out that way, but that's not a conscious kind of kind of thing. It's when I when I have the inspiration, I feel like I have to I have to get it down on the canvas. I have to express it. Uh, that 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 that's something so satisfying when that condition appears again in my being. That uh, I don't know. One presumes that because people come and they f find paintings that they like and they say that they like living with them, they like them on the wall, they, they, their expressions. You can see my art at hoopercdunbar.com if you want. You'll see a lot of paintings there. It's and also on Instagram under Hooper Dunbar. You've got a whole lot of the more recent years works are on Instagram as well. So there is someone that is referring to your art and you, you can see Andrew Singer uh, wrote, Mr. Dunbar has mentioned how his own work in an abstract mode in painting has, he says, paraphrasing here, let him circumvent certain challenges. Unlike the medium of paint, as the creative word shares the same medium with revelation. There is a tension between using language as a pure artistic medium versus using it as a medium of communication. It raises the question whether a more abstract approach to poetry can release more pure expression in language as an exciting avenue to pursue. Yes quite there are some poets that are would have been very different in the the character of their expression some of them that attracted me when i was a teenager particularly i was fascinated with gertrude stein and her manner of expression quite out of the ordinary but i think it's true this is there's a challenge of language. Certainly it's a language, you know. Um, the lady said to Picasso, asked Picasso, what does this painting mean? He said, Madam, if I could tell you what it means, I wouldn't need to paint it. <laughs> it's an interesting, that's, that's the way I feel about it. You don't ask me what the painting means. If you can't get any meaning out of it, then you know, I don't know what to, what to say. Uh, Sonia van Kerkhoff has uh, said, one can only reach a genius level in any discipline by training, engagement, and practice. So I, I disagree with the idea that someone has to be class, uh, classed a genius in order to train as an artist or to pursue their music. Yeah, I think that sounded, you know, we all have individual talents and uh, gifts that can be expressed in different ways. We have to find out what they are and bring them forth. And uh, there is so much between inspiration and for lack of another term, let's say the chemistry of painting. 
because with each painting, one uses materials in slightly different way, discovers something and then moves in that direction and experiments with the, the quality of it, whether it's calligraphic in character or impasto or heavy, heavy use of heavy paintings uh, in some of the paintings, heavy paint in some of the paintings, all of that, how, how paintings mix, how much water goes into it, how much medium goes into it, what happens at the, at the different levels of mix between colors, all of that, all of that is your, I think what uh, Sonia is talking about is your, n the nature of your learning how to use materials. Everybody needs to do that, you know. You might want to knit a sweater, but you better know how to knit before you try, because otherwise you're going to have trouble <laughs> pulling it off. So 40 years of artistic experimentation on my part uh, has led me to, to use, utilize certain things that I know how, what I want to do with and how, how it influences layered there's a lot of layering the paintings you'll see in the examples that are online you can see various levels uh paint one level and then an, add another level and then another dimension multi-dimension dimensional images anyway mr dunbar there is an another artist and designer here in toronto that is asking you how much does the art produced depends on the audience for whom the piece is created or is all art pieces are based on an inner condition independent of the commissioner of the audience that's from reza mostmand to you interesting yes you can see he's, he's an artist asking here. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, look at, I, I started selling things in London several decades ago and nothing was moving very fast. The, the paintings were not selling. And the, the representative there that I had, she, she got in touch and she said, paint red. Women love red, paint red. <laughs> And I dropped her as a representative <laughs> just in that act, because that's, that's not what I'm doing. I'm not trying to please the public by painting things that I know will be attractive or more likely to sell. And when I come up with something that I love and I feel good about the painting, I find other people have a similar reaction to it. Not everybody, but there'll be people that do. And I'm so, so surprised when people come and they said, oh, that's my favorite. And it's not my favorite, but it's their favorite. Fine. That's, <laughs> that's good. Mr. Dunbar, my, my mom used to tell me when I was small that I should know many prayers by heart. Of course, I didn't listen to her, but because there's no book in paradise and, and of course, uh, she was taking for granted that I'm going to paradise, but that's another mistake. The problem is uh, there's no books there. So she said, you have to know the prayers by heart. So my question to you is related to that. Do you think if art is an expression of your feelings and it also manifests itself in other people as a feeling, an emotion, do you think there is art in the other realms of our evolution? And if so, is there music? Is there prayer? Oh yes, all of, the, all of those things in, uh, in an ex exalted forms in the other world, I'm sure, I'm sure there is. It's, how could, they, how could uh, the arts and sciences in this world derive from that world if they weren't there first? And with all kind respect to your dear mother, who I love very much. Uh, if we just read the hidden words, we find out that those words are in the other world first. 
And in the third tablet or the third branch of this, it's written. Those Abdu'l-Bah says those are those are books in the heavenly realm. They're not here. You can't find them. Somebody says I've read uh, those those books that are referred to there. He said it's not true. So the other world is full of the scriptures comes from there. The scripture derives from the heavenly realm. The scripture thrives. It's the sun of the other worlds, the verses of God. And you'll have access, I'm sure. You can only imagine you'll have, excuse me, God, if I'm misspeaking myself here. You will have access to those when you get there. Even without any I memory. I hope so, because I don't have that many memories myself. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's great. There is another artist from Toronto that is asking you this, Esther Maloney. She's saying, I'm fascinated by what you said regarding the bounties that come to different cultures at different times. Whether you have any reflections about technology and its swift advancement recently, particularly around the way it's changing our ways of relating to one another, social media, virtual reality, etc. What should I say about that, Nason? You could do a short or a long one. I, I, I hope you give a long answer to that because it's a wonderful question. I'm sorry, I lost my way in the middle. Uh, I got thinking about something else. Forgive me. Go ahead and repeat it then. Okay. Uh, I'm fascinated by what you said regarding the bounties that come to different cultures at different times, whether yeah. you have any reflections about technology and its swift advancement recently, particularly around the way it's changing our ways of relating to one another social media and even zoom here that i think she's yes i implying. think this is one of the one of the bounties that the baha'i community everybody's been provided with it's very helpful to the baha'i community uh to see each other and to mm, sweep across continents and countries and things even if temporarily we shouldn't get too distracted from our community goals and core activities, but at the same time, it's, it's wonderful that we can see each other and share our own vision. And it, th this is all a confirmation of the discovery, the level of discovery, the rate of discoveries. Think of it in the outside world, they, they recognize that there's more new discoveries every day. There's just terrific explosion of understanding and knowledge about all the fields of life. This uh, Baha'u'llah says this revelation is as an eye to past ages and centuries. Where Abdu'l-Bah is saying that we've lost track of history, but through the sciences that we're developing, we're able to see back into history and understand the, all the different stages that the planet has gone through. And those sciences before the Baha'u'llah's coming didn't exist. Look at the, the paintings, the German paintings of Christ in the Holy Land. They're all dressed up in German clothing and things. It's, it's just this kind of, they, they didn't have any knowledge. What, what, was the, what were the earlier costumes like? Now we have some knowledge of it. We've, we've all kinds of special studies are made and it will only increase it looks like it's just exploding on us i know mr olenga you said shogi Fendi when he was there in the 50s um told him he said that the, the people of the world will spread out they will live you know all over and they'll be instant communication and there'll be travel rapid travel one would taxi he said to the holy land and the everything's going aerial he said all of our travels will be in the air even individually he said we'll be in the air and we'll pull up all these ugly highways and plant beautiful gardens and 
just teases tease us with that. <laughs> Meanwhile, Mr. Alinga also told me, he said, Shoghi Fendi said, Abdul Baha said that this planet is the hell of the planets. It's the lowest, most degraded of our whole solar system. Whatever that means. Yet we have Baha'u'llah appearing with this great revelation just to counteract the terrific darkness that exists and the degradation of the human race that's been going on is really hopeless. Well, unfortunately, we are starting to approach the end of this fireside and there are so many questions. Um, I thank you all for being here, but most of all, uh, Mr. Dunbar, thank you so much for being here. I, I, I'm sure everybody has, uh, has seen you in the weekly presentations that you are having on Thursdays and on uh, Sundays, and, and, and it's incredible. This one gave us a little taste of the personal uh, Hooper Dunbar in a way that I hope it was important for everyone. Uh, would you be able to uh, have some, maybe finish uh, some words about harmony and arts and the universe uh, and in God's revelation in the way that would be your closing remarks or uh, would you like to extend to some uh, points that you didn't address? I'd like to me I'd like to mention something I think that's because people will find it I think useful and helpful and it's not quite right on what you're saying but it it is in a sense and that is Abdu'l-Bahá has elaborated on the fact that there are God has created two books the book of revelation and the book of creation well, so we have the prophets bringing the revelation and that's one one kind of a book. The other book, he says, is the open tablet of existence. You see that phrase in the writings, or the the panoply of creation. In other words, the expression of all of the names and attributes of God in all of the signs of God that are surrounding us, both above, below, below and within, and every various aspect of our existence is surrounded by signs of God. If we became aware of those, the world, instead of place, being a place of darkness, suddenly becomes the illumined face of God. Everywhere you look, uh, one of the phrases of divine revelation, everywhere you look, there is the face of God. And just the, think of the spiritual upliftment we get when the, when we see a beautiful sky or a tree that's flowering or so, so many so many things like that and i think the growing awareness the more we read the verses of god and let me suggest if you don't have prayers and meditations at your bedside and reading it continually i would urge you to do so that book has been created by the guardian and he hoped that above all the books that he created and translated, he, that that would be the one that the friends would use to draw nigh unto Baha'u'llah, that he might draw nigh unto them. Love me that I may love thee. If thou lovest me not, my love can in no wise reach thee. We need to pursue uh, reading these meditations as well as the prayers that are in that book there are meditations i know for years i got i would start reading one of those and it would say thou seest me shut up in my prison house and i say oh that's not for me and i'd skip it why has he translated all these because it for the first time we have an insight into the nature of the manifestation into this duality that he's human and divine at the same time you suppose Baha'u'llah didn't know that Nawab went to a heavenly glorious destiny when she died? But he can't eat for three months. He doesn't reveal any verses. He's such deep sorrow for the loss of his wife. 
how does it work? It's it's mysterious, you know, very mysterious. Anyway, endless things to talk about. Thank you very much, Nathan, and thank you, friends, for your patience you so and listening. To all this. My goodness. We yes. all enjoy it, and and I I hope everybody can uh, can demonstrate the love we had for this beautiful presentation and the way you you addressed maybe putting everyone out of mute so people could uh, express their gratitude for what we went. Well, thank thank you thank all you so, so much. much. Thank you so much.